the mindset and me trying to let go of certain areas of the business has been a challenge over the years for sure, especially on the brand and marketing side. But, um, you know, as I started to kind of let go and put more people in command, that's when things really grow. I mean, at the end of the day, you cannot build a business by yourself. You, you have to have a good team behind you. Here's the thing. The fastest growing companies in the world, they're small businesses, often with less than 100 employees. So how are gritty entrepreneurs, CEOs, and founders like us going up against massive markets, scaling teams, building systems, and skyrocketing to success before crashing and burning? This podcast will give you those answers. My name is Chris Ronzio. Welcome to the fastest growing companies. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Chris Ronzio. Today, we're here with Chase Fisher. He is the CEO and founder of Blenders Eyewear. What's up, Chase? What's going on, man? How are you? Great. Thank you for being here. I can't wait for you to share this rocket ship story of yours. For sure, man. Excited. So before we get into it, I'm going to ask you to just really quick share what Blenders is all about. Uh, but for anyone that hasn't seen like the Instagram ads and the amazing content you guys put out, I actually bought my wife like four pairs of your sunglasses before a vacation we went on because I, I could. I was It was like, let me just, instead of getting her one pair, let me go buy her all these different kinds. I gave it to her before we got on the plane and she's become a huge fan. I love that, man. That was so cool. Yeah. So tell us real quick, like what what is uh, Blender's Eyewear all about? Yeah. So I started Blender's back in 2012. We are a pre, we are a lifestyle brand here in San Diego that specializes in all different types of sunglasses, really bold design, vibrant colorways um, at an affordable price point. Um, and kind of the whole idea just really came from when, you know, I went to go see my favorite DJ at a nightclub and I, I wore some neon green sunglasses from Target that received crazy amounts of attention. And uh, later that night, you know, it was the idea was born on the dance floor. And um, I was working as a surf coach at the time. So I was spending all my time at the beach and um, couldn't afford any sunglasses that I liked and saw a real big gap in the market between your high end fashion sunglasses and your low end beach knockoffs like the ones I was wearing. And so uh, dove in head first, borrowed 2000 bucks and built blenders all around that like active lifestyle culture of San Diego. Um, and we've, we've been in business for just past nine years now. So it's been a crazy run. Amazing. Well, if you think about the success and kind of the turning point, how much would you attribute to the brand and the lifestyle component versus the product or the pricing? Because it seemed like kind of the perfect storm. So how would you break that out? For sure. I mean, I've always been a big brand guy since day one. And I, and I knew the value of building a brand just from being a, you know, a surfer in high school and being sponsored and working with a lot of companies. I knew that the brand was extremely important to our longevity. So I focused on that since, from day one. Um, and then in today's day and age with like social media, like you have to you marry that with a great product because if you have a bad product now, it's just word of mouth travels faster than ever before. So, um, yeah, you really need to focus on those two things. In my opinion, those are held in very high regard as well as customer experience. Yeah. So the, the product is kind of table stakes. Like it has to be good. It has to work. Otherwise you're not going to keep customers, but if you didn't have a brand, no one would know about it. So totally. you were able to master that. Uh, I remember I had a mentor of mine that was sitting outside like this little furniture shop and he's like, they make amazing stuff, but they're going out of business because no one knows about them. So oh. like, when you were building this, what was the intentional strategy of like, how do we get this out there? How do we tell people about this? Yeah. So this was back in, I mean, this was kind of pre-social media, right? A little bit before Instagram was even a thing. I mean, we started, when I started, I was selling shades out of my backpack on the beach, like grassroots, <laughs> out in the pavement. I was going to uh, pool parties. I was going to music festivals. I was going to surf contests. I was going to street fairs and literally building the brand organically. Um, Cause that's, that's all I knew how to do. I didn't know how to build a website. I didn't know how to drive traffic. Um, it was all about just getting the brand out there on an organic level. And for me, that was extremely valuable because everything was born, you know, face to face and, uh, it was born with like people and relationships and in, in the real world. So it was a lot of just me running, running and gunning early on. And then when social media started to kind of take shape and Instagram got popular, that was like, okay, all of our tactics really migrated to building the brand and our presence online. Um, so yeah, it was a lot of, a lot of manual work, a lot of, you know, long days in the sun, but I want to just want to trade it for anything. 
That's great. So five years ago or so, you were a small team. You were like seven people. And this year, you're going to be like 60 people. So you've had this big explosion over the last few years in the people side of the business. And I'm sure you've had to grow a lot as a CEO. So take me back to like when you were selling out of your backpack, how did you first realize, wow, this is a business and I need to take this seriously? Yeah. I mean, look, when you just start and you bootstrap, like you're wearing every hat in the book. And so for me, it was like trying to figure out how to do marketing, how to do social media, how to do operations, how to do logistics. I mean, I was literally doing everything because I couldn't afford to hire anyone. So it, it, it's a blessing and a curse, right? I mean, it's the it's as you grow, like you become so attached to the business um, that sometimes it's hard to let go. But on the flip side, it's really important to know those positions so you know how to hire for them and you know what to look for. So the mindset and me trying to let go of certain areas of the business has been a challenge over the years, for sure, especially on the brand and marketing side. But, um, you know, as I started to kind of let go and put more people in command, that's when things really grow. I mean, at the end of the day, you cannot build a business by yourself. You, you have to have a good team behind you. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely been a huge focus. So I want to come back to delegation because I know that's hard for, for all of us, for a lot of people. But at the very beginning, wh who were the key roles that you surrounded yourself with that really made an impact for you? So we hired a really good designer right off the bat. I mean, that was like our first main hire. Um, second was just more like intern work just to kind of really help us with like reaching out to athletes and influencers to send product to. Um, and then we just started working e externally with a lot of content creators to kind of help build our, our brand look and feel, which I thought was really, really important because most people miss that. And if you're going to build a brand that needs to be visually like it needs to look good. So yeah, more on the creative side was some of the early hires. And then we hired some just customer service people to help with customer service and um, slowly built our, our way up. But everything was built from, from the ground up versus top down. So a lot of people, when they're focused on making the product or delivering some service, they've got that early team. And it sounds like yours was the designers and creators. So what were your first couple like manager or executive sort of hires? Because that feels like a, a turning point for a lot of businesses. Totally. Um, yeah, we didn't get much manager level in it for at least a few years. You know what I mean? It was just kind of like there wasn't enough work like like for one department to being to bring in like a specialist. We just had like a bunch of jack of all trades coming in. Um, but I didn't really build out a leadership team until 20, 2018, um, which is pretty crazy. So I was pretty late in the game uh, to build out a strong leadership team. So, I mean, it's still an area of focus. But uh, yeah, that, that, that's been a challenge for me over the years is building a really strong, you know, exec team. Yeah. So are there areas that you've had to learn to let go of things that you were actually really good at that you've had to pass on to someone else? Yeah. It's easy I mean, to give away the stuff we don't want to do, right? No, for sure. I was, I was running the Instagram for like seven years, man, like or six, six years almost. Like it, it, for me, giving up Instagram was like giving away my baby. Like, <laughs> like, like my child, like it was so difficult for me to let go of that. Um, and I'm still, I'm still involved. Right. But at the same time, like that was probably the hardest thing for me to let go of was a lot of the creative, the brand, the look, the feel, the photography, things like that, that like really mean a lot to me, um, were very hard for me to let go of. And I'm sure when you brought that first person on to help with it, you were probably really critical of how they were doing it because you had such a way you wanted it done. Right. Totally. Yeah. You become so like zoned in on the way that you want it done. And like, it's like one word's off or that caption's wrong or like the edit's a little cropped weird. Like you're just looking for every possible flaw and uh, it can make you go crazy sometimes. So uh, sometimes you got to step away from it. <laughs> so, so any insights on like, you know, if someone is trying to train someone else on, on a thing that they're really good at, what's helped you to be able to step back or to be able to give some grace? Like what have you learned through that process? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, setting up templates has been huge, right? Like I'm a, I'm a guy that needs like, I need to visually see things, you know, personally. And I, and I would assume that others do as well. So for me, I just try to make it as simple and visually, you know, pleasing as possible. Um, and just be clear with your message and communication, you know? And I think that's, sometimes it's always a big challenge, like the smallest things are sometimes the hardest things. Right. So, um, so yeah, I think it's just kind of like, letting them take first, first stabs at it, providing feedback, and then knowing how to give proper feedback, right? Like there's a whole framework for giving feedback um, versus just saying what you don't like and what, and what they need to change. So um, yeah, I mean, I'm constantly trying to get better at that every single day. 
So with a brand like Blenders, I bet you guys get a ton of inbound interest, people that want to work for you because you're just out there, people know about you. And so how do you vet through all those people that just want to be associated with you because you think they think you're cool from the yeah. ones that can actually do the job and like move the business forward? Yeah, I mean, that's a tough one, right? Because as you hire as you hire new people you, and they have to have certain skill sets, right? Like you want them to be coming in and adding value. Um, at the same time, like I just try and scale it back. Like I just try and really get to know them personally. Like when I talk to people or we're, we're like interviewing people, I'm not like grilling them with questions. I'm just like, Hey, what do you like to do for fun? What do you like to travel? Like what, what, what makes you, you right. And really try and connect with them on that level, find out what their values are, what their passions are. Um, what, what brands they like, like why, you know what I mean? Like just connecting with them on a personal level is my way of kind of understanding, are they going to be a cultural fit? And if they're going to be a cultural fit, they'll be, they'll be trainable. They'll be, you know, we can mold them, things like that. But um, yeah, it's important that you build a brand that has cultural values that people that truly identify themselves with, with uh, whatever it is we're doing. Yeah, I'm right with you. I mean, just being able to get to know the people that that are going to work at the business, I think is so important. So once once you decide someone does have the fit and they're going to be a, a match for the team and for the role, um, how do you get them indoctrinated? Like how how do you share with them the blender story and culture and and like make them part of the team? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously there's a whole onboarding process and it's it's still not perfect, but you know, it's it's definitely different per, per person, but yeah, I mean, we bring people in, um, you know, we get them comfortable. We ask them some questions, like we get them meeting with every single person on the team, which I think is important just because it really gets them involved in, in the business and gets them understanding certain parts of the business, even if it might not pertain to their department. Um, so, you know, we like to have them meet with a lot of people. I'll meet with everyone. Um, we'll go over certain things and kind of like vision, kind of brand values, things like that, what we hold in high regard. Um, and then, you know, we kind of just start to really just do check-ins and we do like team happy hours, introduce them at company meetings, but everything's remote now. So it's kind of like keeping that connection and that cultural, uh, like building culture through zoom is pretty, pretty hard. So, um, got to find new ways to keep people engaged. Does everyone get to pick a set of sunglasses or something when they get started? Yeah, no, for sure. There's definitely like a, a certain amount of sunglasses you get per year. We have like team swag that we give everyone like hoodies and hats. And so that, that that's exclusive for, for employees and team writers. So we have stuff like that, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's all about the people at the end of the day, you know? Yeah, totally. Well, I, I, I would struggle to work at an apparel and, and kind of accessory company. I worked at Abercrombie when I was in college and spent my entire paycheck on, on just like the new stuff that came out. So yeah, <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure your people are, are great customers too. Yeah. Um. So if looking back, you know, if you had to pinpoint some key turning points on how you really like unlocked a new level of scale. Um, a lot of people struggle to get past the backpack stage and then they struggle to get past the group of seven people stage. And so are there things that happened, you know, in the market with the product, with the team that you felt like really propelled you forward? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of, there's definitely some like, you know, early wins, right? I want to say there are, there are home runs. There's no home runs in this game. It's all just small small wins and, you know, getting on base a lot. But I think we did a lot of things wrong at the beginning, which made us understand like how to do things right. Like you got to make mistakes in order to kind of know, like to correct the course. Um, but I would say definitely like the rise of social media, Instagram was a huge one for us to really like migrate from the sand on the beach to, you know, building a business online and then figuring out how to like take that and drive traffic to our website. Like that was big personally. Um, Figuring out paid social as well was also another big one. Um, on the product side, it was definitely like we saw, you know, we, we went from seven to 30 mil in one year um, because of just changes we made in our, in our marketing efforts and our product. You know, we were so heavily male focused for so long. But when we started designing women's products and marketing to women specifically, we saw a massive increase because women are buying two to three to four to five pairs of shades at a time. And they shop a lot more than men. And that was huge for us. So things like that, as well as taking bigger risks on certain kind of colorways and frames that were more progressive and a little more, more wild, ended up being huge wins for us. So um, yeah, I mean, you add all those up and then just the brand building and things like that kind of accumulate to larger ones over time. At what point did you have to add some external 
e-commerce experience you know like you had a you had this intuition for the product and the the culture and the the brand um, but when you're doing those kind of numbers like every little bit helps in terms of what they're adding to their cart and this sort of thing so what was that point yeah i mean for sure there was we have so many different vendors and agencies that we work with externally that are like email social things like that so um, a lot of that was kind of done on the marketing side. You know, we didn't have much internal focus on the site, so to say. Um, most of the internal team was just kind of customer service, just trying to being able to like feed the growth and like service the growth. Um, but yeah, it was more so just kind of like mid tier marketing people that would come in, help with social media, things like that. But we didn't have anyone like spe- specific doing like CRO stuff until like, you know, now. Right. Um, but uh, yeah. Cool. So looking forward, I mean, you've built this enormous business, huge success, um, I, like awesome articles. I, 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 I saw an article recently. I don't remember if it was New York Times or it was some big article. So everybody go find Chase on LinkedIn, check out the articles. But w- where to from here? What are you excited about in the next few years? Yeah, so we're definitely at a very awesome, exciting stage for Blenders. Um, we just launched internationally, which is really exciting. We just launched in Australia and Canada about two months ago, and we're seeing really big success there. So definitely going to focus on scaling our international side of the business. Uh, We also launched prescription earlier this year. So we're trying to kind of like figure out the nuances with that because that's also a huge market. Um, A lot of category expansion with our snow, things like that. Uh, Retail is also very exciting for blenders. We were opening up our second flagship store and we plan to open about, you know, 15 to 20 over the next five to 10 years. Wow. Scaling retail, which I think is really interesting because most brands are running away from retail. Um, And yeah, and those are definitely like the kind of the key areas, right? And then just continuing to build our online presence and stay and stay true to the brand and making sure our customers are are stoked. I love it. Well, everyone that's listening, I mean, you probably have seen Blenders online. So you got to hear a little bit of this inside story about the stages that Chase has grown this business through. Like I said, seven people to 60 people. And it sounds like growing and scaling tremendously from there. So follow this guy, get on his radar, watch this story because this is only the beginning. Uh, Chase, if people want to find you, where should they go? Yeah, definitely. Check us out online, blendershour.com. You could follow me on Insta. I'm always available at Chase Fisher. And then, um, yeah, just at Blenders Hour everywhere else. Amazing. All right, everyone. Well, you heard from Chase how to invest in your brand, how to grow your team, how to take some responsibilities off your plate and scale your product or service like he has. Amazing story. Hopefully you can take a page from his playbook and put it in yours. Chase, thanks again for being here. So happy, bro. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks for listening to the Fastest Growing Companies podcast. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a review. If you found the information helpful, share it with your friends and family that can benefit from it. You can also find Trainual's company account at Trainual, just like a training manual. We'll see you next time.